Welcome to The Lead, the New Lines magazine podcast. I'm Lydia Wilson, and this is a podcast where we delve into the biggest ideas, events, and personalities from around the world. Modernism was a movement that broke the mold across literature, philosophy, music, architecture, and many other artistic and intellectual fields, summarized most famously by poet Ezra Pound's injunction to make it new. Consciously breaking with traditions from classical influences to the romanticism of the 19th century, modernism sought to find new forms of expression, producing aesthetic movements from Bauhaus to futurism. In literature, writers such as Virginia Woolf and James Joyce experimented with extended interior monologues to capture a more nuanced, they hoped, portrayal of human consciousness. With me today is Mayal Naqib, who teaches English and comparative literature at Kuwait University. She is the author of the novel An Unlasting Home and the short story collection The Hidden Light of Objects. She recently wrote an article for New Lines entitled A Portrait of James Joyce's Lessons in a Kuwait English Class, which will be in the forthcoming summer print edition of the magazine. She is joining me today to discuss what modernism can teach us, whether as students or writers. May, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Lydia. Now, May, you're the expert here. What did you think of my formulation of modernism in the introduction? It's such a contested word, isn't it? So without getting into the weeds too much, (laughs) how do you characterize it for your students? I think you did a, I mean, you did a great job. My sense of, you know, modernism is that it was a cultural artistic movement that was responding to the incredible transformations that were happening at the turn of the century, you know, from industrialization to urbanization to um, modernization in, in all areas of life, you know, the extensive expansion of advertising, but also the technological changes, the, 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 ra- the, rail, the, train, the train system, the standardization of time, all of these experiences were changing people's understanding of themselves in the world. And this artistic movement was was responding to that, engaging with with that. So this it was really such a dynamic moment in the history of, of humanity, really. And these artists were responding and engaging. They were both reflecting that experience, but also, you know, combating it, I think, in some ways. So what they were doing wasn't simply, it was really, as you said, a kind of shift away from realism and naturalism, although it included elements of that, but it was reflecting a kind of changed reality, not the one that had it, that had uh, dominated in the 19th century. So I think that what was also interesting about modernism was that it wasn't just a aesthetic a question of aesthetic experimentation, which it certainly was, but I think it retained, it wanted to cultivate a sense of critique, you know, and I think that's what is interesting to me about modernism even today, or why it remains so resonant, I think, for me. Well, let's take an example, and why not the example of your essay? Do you think you can somehow describe it to listeners who haven't read it? Yeah, so I read Portrait of the Artist when I was 14 for the first time. And I stole the book off my older sister's shelf. She was reading it at university, also Kuwait University, interestingly enough. And I picked it up and I started reading. It, was, it wasn't an easy read, no doubt, but it spoke to me. It really resonated. I think in, for, for a number of reasons, but one of them was because this was literally the portrait of an artist as a young person, I didn't really, that it was a young man mattered far less to me than than you would think. I really, I identified with Stephen as somebody who also was seeing themselves as a writer. I was beginning to have a sense that 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 writing was the thing I wanted to do. And here was an audacious young teenager coming into his own as a writer and the text itself was incredibly experimental and it kind of pushed my sense of what I'd been reading my whole life. But here was this book that pushed my sense of what language could do, you know, challenging me, slowing me down. I had to read and reread. I didn't get it. I'm sure that half of it was lost on me at, at that age. But then the second layer that really drew me to um, that novel was how, you know, again, how critical Stephen was of his environment, church, 
nation and family. And those ties resonated so much with me growing up in Kuwait, where those same lines, what, what Stephen might call, would call the hollow sounding voices, you know, restrain a young person and a young person, you know, who, who, who has ambitions, who's thinking, bucks against those restraints. And so I was cheering Stephen on. And it just really viscerally spoke to me, that book. Um, yeah, maybe we should just characterize it, though. I mean, it's a very loosely autobiographical piece, isn't it? It's, it's not so long, not the tome that Ulysses is, but it tracks the interior debates of a young person going through Oh, everything from the day-to-day meal times, day-to-day walks, right through to a religious retreat, hasn't it got? And 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 listening to the clerical approach and and responding to it both pro and anti and watching those tensions, I think, is at the heart of it, that young people haven't got it figured out and they are kind of struggling to absorb, maintain, process and respond to the, the 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 influences coming their way. Would you say that was an okay characterization of the book? Absolutely, and and beginning to end. So it, what's so interesting is that it's written in this free and it, well, the 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 majority of it is written in this free and direct speech style, which right. is third right. person but very close, almost first person in its tone. So it starts out with baby talk, pretty much baby Stephen, you know, all the way to the end where he graduates, he's going to be going off into the world. And then just the last few pages switch to first person. And that's Stephen, you know, writing in his diary, which was another thing that drew me so much to portrait when I read it at 14, because I had been keeping a diary since the age of about 10. And it's the diary writing that turned me into a writer, really, because I was just obsessed with writing things down, things that meant nothing really, but you just expand on them, you turn them around, you, you know, you experiment with voice, all of really, I realize now that the hours and hours I put into writing and keeping a diary was like my was really a kind of apprenticeship into becoming a writer, you know, and so that too, I was like, oh, Stephen as well keeps this diary, you know, and you're absolutely right to say that we witness in portrait all the the challenges that Stephen has to face. So the, the the nationalist arguments for and against and the different factions, the different sides, the religious, and he's drawn in, you know, as young people often are, they get seduced by a religious calling or, you know, they're not, they're unsure, you know, of what it is that they believe or don't believe. And they have to kind of, they have to feel uncomfortable. And, and Stephen certainly does. And, and you're right to remember that lecture, the the sermon about hell and hellfires and all these things that is just awful. And it goes on and on and on purposely, because <laughs> yeah. I think that Joyce wanted his readers to really feel how overwhelming that rhetoric can be, and how it can really strangle you know, in strangle youthful enthusiasm and, and, and in a way paralyze you with fear, which is what Stephen goes through. He's is almost paralyzed with fear and has nightmares after that. And then he comes out of it, you know. And so, as you say, we see this kind of trajectory from childhood into just the moment just before he sets out into the world. And for me, reading it at that age was really just, you know, it's not that also I'm not sort of, I, I didn't turn into a Joyce scholar or anything by any means I'm not and didn't read his, you know, didn't um, have the same kind of connection with his other works that I, as I, I did with, with this one. But Portrait is one that I've come back to over the years. And yeah, you, I, I'll let you go ahead, Lydia, but then we can maybe talk about how it is to teach it as well in Kuwait. Well, yeah, absolutely. I'd love to explore that. I just wanted to ask one more question first, which was, you described very well how it resonated with you as a kind of fledgling writer, keeping a diary and all the rest of it, and, and also trying to make sense of the world. But I think you also wrote in your essay about certain resonances with the culture you were growing up in. And that's probably quite surprising to a lot of people to link Joyce's Ireland and a, and a teenager's life in Kuwait a century or no, not quite, but you know, many decades later. Yeah. What was what was so recognizable to you about the early 20th century that portrait of an artist as a young man portrays 
Well, I think it is exactly those three things that Stephen identifies as hollow sounding, the hypocrisies he picks up on. One has to do with the narrative of the, of the nation. So the, na the feeling of nationalism, of uh, linguistic pride, of wanting to define, which makes sense in a colonized context for Stephen, you know, in, and what he was and, and the environment that he's that he's trying to convey in Kuwait. This was I was coming of age. I mean, I, I came, you know, I was coming of age in the 80s, but, you know, growing up in this in the 70s. This was a moment where Kuwait's statehood was pretty well established, but it was also going through a kind of golden age. I was able to witness that golden, the end kind of of that golden period. So there was a lot of, I think, you know, you the nationalist rhetoric exists and it always kind of does. But again, I think young people, the job of young people is to question precisely those kinds of uh, assumptions and narratives, you know, the, the things that are inherited. Family, as you as you, you're familiar with in the Middle East, is a formidable force in a young person's life, and what they can and can't do. What you know, the restrictions that exist. I mean, I was very lucky. I grew up in a relatively liberal household. I went to an American school. Kuwait itself, at the time in the 80s, 70s, 80s, 60s, 70s, 80s, was very open and liberal. So it isn't the place that it would become. Where in some ways, I think Joyce's words are even more applicable today, let's say, than they were even at the time when, when I was growing up. But I did witness, you know, family restrictions and was aware that family was a force that young people had to reckon with, especially young women. And and so then, and then, of course, religion. Now, religion, again, at the time that I was growing up, was not the kind of force it would become. But nonetheless, it was too much for me. <laughs> So I felt like these three elements were were restrictions that I wanted to challenge in my way and and certainly did. And so, again, I felt like I had it, it was just like a, I don't want to say exactly a blueprint, but it was just a kind of model for something that came before something that I could relate to. And I think, of course, in literature, the best stories, the, the ones that are immortal are the ones that it doesn't matter when they were written. You know, and and that it will apply. Anyway, that's a bit of a cliche to say, but it but it's true. You know, it should resonate all the way through time, and we can pick it up and connect. And that I think is the special thing that fiction can do. Well, we'll get on to how how you've attempted to do that in your fiction in a bit. And yes, great literature resonates over the centuries, but to a greater and lesser extent, right? And as you say, the nationalism and the religion for sure has changed a lot in your part of the world, in Kuwait, in the Gulf, and probably all over the world. So what is the difference now in teaching it to your students than it was that very first time you experienced it as a teenager? It's so interesting. I mean, so there are a couple of issues in teaching Joyce to my students. So on the one hand, because things in the Middle East, and I'll speak of, of the, my experience in Kuwait, but I think it applies elsewhere. We've seen a rise in Islamism, in conservatism, for a number of complicated political reasons. Um, we've seen a rise in all of this. And we've, we've also seen in Kuwait a rise in patriarchal family structures. And this has to do with the change in, in demographic. We have more conservative families and so on. And this has affected everything. You know, it affects the parliament, it affects the general culture and social systems in Kuwait and how people live, and of course, it, how people live. And of course, it also affects the lives of, of young women. And, so, you're, and you, so you see this kind of dovetailing of the rise in, in religious conservatism and social patriarchal conservatism in, in Kuwait. So it's happening at the levels, again, all, all three the same three levels that we taught or the three same three elements that we we spoke about family religion and even at the level of the nation because there have been more restrictions politically for you know different reasons that are given it can be security reasons to protect the the nation state and so on and the history of you know the invasion has affected the rise of that kind of nationalist conservatism understandably so you'd think that Joyce's narrative would resonate more powerfully with young people today reading it in Kuwait, more than it did with me, because I grew up in a relatively open, more liberal Kuwait. 
but that's not the case. Ah, okay. How do they how do they respond? Well, I think it's not the case because of the difficulty of modernist style. So because this and my and the, my students, and I think this may be true of students everywhere because I've spoken to professors that teach in other parts of the world as well in English departments. And, you know, there's a kind of sense that students are not, they don't have the same kind of attention that reading requires and modernist read the reading of modernist texts more so because of its difficulty because of its experimental um, challenges you know it is never easy it's not just telling a story right the form is the content of of modernist texts and so my students display um, an impatience with the the writing and so the content which would be which it does in fact resonate with them once we slowly and very slowly unpack Joyce's is Joyce's story it does resonate with them but they need to kind of get through have the patience to get through the writing itself so there's this kind of conundrum <laughs> between both I mean that is part of modernism isn't it to kind of slow down our reading and to kind of make us think more you take your students through that basically through in class close readings do you is that how and you you do slow it right down and this is the difference between teaching Joyce 20 years ago when I first started teaching at Kuwait University almost 20 years in 2004 versus today so 20 years ago the students were much more able to grasp the narrative style and the form of the modernist text that I was teaching it didn't require a kind of hand-holding, going through the text page by page, drawing their attention to what the language is. They were more capable of doing that, and we could focus on other other things. Although, obviously, with modernism, the form is a key aspect of what you want to focus on. You can't, you know, you can't let that, you can't just uh, uh, overlook that at all. That is the main part, in fact, I would say, of, of the, the discussion. But the students seemed more capable, and they had, a, you know, their attention was they were more able to slow down themselves and to read it and to kind of really get something out of it. And it resonated with them, with their experiences. And modernism didn't seem so far removed from their experience. I think it has less to do with Euro-American modernism being far removed from Kuwait. And, you know, not that it, it, it doesn't apply or that you can't read it. I think it's, it absolutely does. I think it has more to do with what has happened to young students of literature or young students in general and their capacity to focus and read. And that, of course, has to do with the technologies that they've grown up with in the last, you know, 30 years or or 20 something years. Well, it's a loss to them because modernism is wonderful. (laughs) But let's go back to the idea of modernism as critique. What were you aiming to get out of these or get across to your students out of these very close readings you did? Well, you know, the philosopher Marshall Berman talks about, he he phrases it in a way that I really like. He calls, he talks about modernism's critical bite. And, you know, modernists, they were really about, they wanted the shock of the new. There was something about the shock of the new that would wake people up out of their mainstream bourgeois complacency into, as as you've said, a kind of critical understanding of the world. And you can only do critique by slowing everything down, having the distance to be able to think about what it is that you're observing. With speed, when it goes quickly, you don't have that necessary gap in order to allow modernism or, or whatever else to have or to kind of to you to 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 implement or to to kind of what's the word I'm looking for to 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 have this critical effect on on you as a reader you know so so that's that's what I try to then exp, you know convey to my my students is that the difficulty that you're having is in order for you to slow down and they do have to slow down because everything around them is so speeded up and then ask yourself what it is or why it is that it's doing because it, why is why is it that it's doing this thing experimentally it isn't gratuitous because modernists were thinking very carefully about every word every comma every way of conveying and you know you, you quoted Ezra Pound at the beginning 
Ezra Pound was certainly one of those who considered every word and cutting things down to their absolute minimal necessity, you know, in order to precisely shock the reader and wake them up. I mean, Joyce writes about it in Portrait, the the difference or the kind of debate between what, you know, his sense of aesthetics, stasis versus kinesis, static, the static experience of art, where art, again, stops, it becomes timeless, or it holds you in place so that you can think versus movement, which is more historical, you know, of co- and and I think you need both. So you you can't think about art as being timeless and removed from the world. And in fact, I think this is the thing about modernism, why it got has gotten kind of a bad rap once it was codified as being this elitist, apolitical, historical movement that was removed and all about organic forms and separated from the world and so on that is not taking into consideration class or gender or uh, race or other uh, key issues. But if you read any of the modernist texts, they are full of everything political, all the economic questions that they were dealing with, war, the transformations of society. I mean, Wolf is certainly one we could we could think about in in this context. So I think it was it was kind of, you know, I think literary movements get categorized in a certain way in preparation for the next movement, which is less different than the one preceding than we might think. (laughs) Yes. I agree. I agree. But I want to kind of move on to your own writing. And you took the title of your recent novel from Joyce, didn't you? An Unlasting Home. Can you tell us where this came from and why you chose it? Yeah, so I hadn't been thinking about Joyce at all as I was writing, not consciously. But in retrospect, when I think and all this stuff happened in coming up with the title, it made me realize how much Joyce and how I, how much of him I had absorbed and how much it did, in fact, inform what I was doing in An Unlasting Home. So I had a working title for a very long time. For many of the years that I was writing An Unlasting Home, I had this working title in my head. And the trope of birds runs through An Unlasting Home. And there was the word birds in my working title. But my title wasn't really working anymore, <laughs> and uh, my editor really didn't think that it it re- it resonated enough for her. It really didn't speak to the novel, and it it wasn't the right one. And I opened myself up, though it was really difficult because when you have a title for, you know, however many years you're working on a long project, you really kind of have a stake in it. But I opened myself to the idea that, okay, let me think about another title. And I just went through hundreds of possible titles. It was painful. And I have, you know, I have just pages and pages of titles going back and forth and nothing worked for me at all. And the few that I picked out didn't work for my editor either. And then it was in the middle of the night that I remembered Joyce was, Joyce's writing is full of birds. And I remembered in portrait specifically, I I went to my, my shelf and picked up portrait, my copy of portrait and started flipping through. And I found all these references to birds. And then I landed on this quote. Then he was to go away. Yeah, I can give it to you. So then he was to go away for they were birds ever going and coming, building ever an unlasting home under the eaves of men's houses and ever leaving the homes they had built to wander. And I just thought that that was such a beautiful um, depiction of the characters in my novel, the women who build these unlasting homes literally under the eaves of men's houses and then leave them migrate for necessity, for ambition, for whatever it is, to other places in order to to, to wander, really, and to, to, and to find that these homes will always be unlasting. And so this sense that this, I just, it just jumped out at me, an unlasting home. And I knew immediately this was the title and my editor loved it immediately. And so that was it. Well, I just to kind of put that in context, your novel is a portrait of generations of Kuwaiti women, loosely described, I suppose, as Kuwaiti, because it stretches, obviously, it stretches back far before the country's official date of independence, and and right into the time 
when there was far more movement between <clears throat> different Arab countries, I suppose, different Arab areas. But it also takes us right into the present, if a slightly tweaked version of the present. And I don't want to give any spoilers, but <laughs> I can say that it's not an optimistic picture of contemporary Kuwaiti society, is it? I mean, I think I'd go so far in saying, and, and feel free to push back, it kind of comes across as an elegy for your country. It pays homage to the people, the history, the culture, while showing the present as increasingly conservative and, and stifling. And, and yet you still choose to remain there. Can you, can you tell me about that tension? I do think that an unlasting home, I think it, an elegy is a great way of describing it. And I think that in some ways, it's a story about a, about lost futures. So it's it can, as you said, it goes from the early twentieth century and it crosses across the Middle East, so from Lebanon, Turkey, Iraq, all the way to India. There's a character, a key character, who is from Goa, and from the early twentieth century into the that golden period I mentioned in the fifties, when Kuwait was, you know, exporting oil to its independence in nineteen sixty one all the way to 2013, exactly as you've said. But in order to understand this moment in 2013, when the protagonist, Sara, who's a philosophy professor at Kuwait University, is accused of blasphemy under a new law that makes it a capital crime, you can only really understand both how Sara has arrived at this junction and how Kuwait has arrived at this junction by going back. And then going back and gathering all these various stories of these women makes it possible to understand what Kuwait has lost. So, you know, this, again, the lost potential, the lost possibility, possibilities for this country that was really quite magical in many ways, I think. Kuwait, historically, not just in the present, not just in the contemporary or modern moment, but going back thousands of years, has this layered history and it is a junction, you know, between places, both for animal life, including birds, you know, it's a kind of migratory intersecting point and people and trade and all of this and geography and geology. So, you know, you can dig, dig, dig and find, you know, a remnants of civilizations that go back thousands of years. So all of this together, it, you would think constructs a future or, or a present and future, which is just bright. And that moment was there. And Sada, the character, is kind of um, a product of it. But then, obviously, because of the invasion, but not only the invasion, many other things as well, both regional and um, local, culminate in Kuwait not fulfilling the promise of what it could have become. So I think that answered the first half of your question, but then the se the second half, I can't remember what you said, <laughs> what you asked. Well, actually, just leading on from that, I just wonder if you could actually say then, and and how what is the future for teaching modernism in Kuwait? Yes, okay, and that also reminds me of the the second half of the question, which is why do you stay? given that it's an elegy or given that, you know, I can identify all of these elements in Kuwait that are, you know, disheartening, disturbing, why is it that one stays? And I think, I think that, you know, you make, you make the decisions that you do in your life and you, I don't, you know, I think that I am the writer that I am because of the context in part. I don't think if I had left Kuwait, I would have been able to write neither An Unlasting Home or The Hidden Light of Objects. I don't think that they are, I don't think that these books are simply Kuwait books, because I, I think that they can speak across, just like, I mean, I'm not comparing myself to Joyce here, but Joyce kind of fabulates an Ireland that appeals way beyond, you know, the borders and boundaries of Ireland. And so they spoke to me all the way to Kuwait when I was 14. And I think I try to fabulate a Kuwait that does the same. So I have had people, you know, that, that are in the UK or in the US and have nothing, no connection to the Arab world. But you know, there's something that connects there about a lost place or a lost experience. It's one that we all experience, you know, just with the passage of time. 
So I stay because it's a tough question, Lydia. You know, it's a tough question. But part of me is connected. You know, my my mom is buried there. There's an element of connection to the land and maybe still to some of the potentialities and maybe also for my writing. And in terms of modernism and teaching modernism, I'm even less optimistic. I don't see, I mean, for this class, which I was so excited to teach and maybe in past in the in the past would have maybe 20, 25 students because they were small classes, 400 upper level classes generally. But this time had seven students registered. And that's in part because we have much, you know, fewer, much fewer literature students in our department, which teaches both literature and linguistics. And I think in part because of this, this problem that I identified about students not wanting to read. So, you know, there, there are fewer students that want to major in, in literature. But then again, you know, modernism, even though I think that at the end, it was a fulfilling experience for my students. I hope I'm not just saying that because I, I, you know, I hope that's not just wishful thinking, but I think that the seven students who registered in the class enjoyed it at the end and got something out of it. But how do we draw them into modernism? I don't, I don't know. I don't, I I think there will be the few that will always, you know, find writers that they're attracted to. And some of those will be modernist, but I'm not sure it's a move that's uh, on the rise in Kuwait, certainly. No. Well, things change over time, so there's always hope. There's always hope. (laughs) May El Naqib, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much, Lydia. It was an absolute pleasure. This has been The Lead, a podcast by New Lines magazine. You can find May El Naqib on Twitter, at May El Naqib. Buy her latest book, An Unlasting Home, at all good bookshops, and read her essay on teaching Joyce in Kuwait in the next print issue of New Lines magazine. This week's episode was produced by Joshua Martin and hosted by me, Lydia Wilson. For more like this, subscribe to The Lead on your favourite podcast app or visit our website, newlinesmag.com.